So hi everybody, we are here today with Deborah Pascali Bonaro. She is a birth and postpartum doula trainer with Donna International, a childbirth educator, chair of the International Mother, Baby and Childbirth Organization, and co-chair of the International Childbirth Initiative. Deborah is also the co-author of the book Orgasmic Birth, your guide to a safe, satisfying, and pleasurable birth experience. Deborah has been a pioneer in reminding humanity that birth can be a full, can be full of pleasure and delight, and has trained thousands of dollars and birth professionals around the world in the practices of gentle birth support. Deborah, thank you so much for being with us today. It's great to have oh. you. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you for that beautiful intro. It's an honor to be here. Good. I would like to start by asking you, what is this of the orgasmic birth, and how did you get interested in the field of pregnancy and labor? So that's a lot of things in yes, there. So I, know, I, I, know. I, know. <laughs> I have to say, I was born into this world interested in pregnancy and birth because even as a young child, I was just fascinated with birth. I wanted to hear birth stories as a little girl. I listened to my great grandmother. I was blessed with her stories and my grandmother and my own story from my mother. And then even as a teenager, I wanted to volunteer and get into labor and delivery. I used to stand outside of the door just hoping the L&D doors would open. I initially went to college in nursing thinking that I would get into labor and delivery, and it was in the process of studying nursing that I was disillusioned with a system that was so medicalized. And in my perspective at the time, the nurses had the heart, they just weren't allowed to use it in their practice because they were so busy doing other things. So I left nursing and went into education really struggling how could i get back to childbirth and and that's where life is so beautiful i became a childbirth educator and i've been attending births as a doula for 34 years and went on to as you said to become a doula trainer and it was in all this work of really living my passion being with people during pregnancy and birth and postpartum and then training many other people all around the world and seeing that so many births were joyful pleasurable blissful ecstatic orgasmic there was this whole language of birth that i felt saw but I didn't hear, it wasn't reflective in our media. Our media was all about pain and fear, right? The music in some of our television shows sounds like Jaws, like you're waiting for impending doom. So it was all of that what I saw personally and what I heard versus what the mass media said had a big disconnect. And it was in that I was like, oh, we have to change this. And I didn't have the answer, but literally I was sound asleep one night and had a vivid dream about making the documentary Orgasmic Birth. It really came to me in that dream state. And I knew that I had to bring out a message that birth is full of love and respect and pleasure. And yes, there are the people that have birthgasms, but there are lots of people, myself included, that birth is just so deeply intimate and opening to the fullness of who we are and who we're receiving in our children and full of love. And that to me is orgasmic. So orgasmic birth in the more formal way was born in a dream, mm -hmm. but it came out of a lifetime of passion and working with women and babies and fathers and partners and families around birth. Exactly. One of the things that you talked about and that I wanted to talk with you is about fear. There is fear of the unknown. And as you said, in your own life, you made a conscious choice. Maybe the beginning was like an intuitive choice, but then it became, you became very familiar with the process of birth. 
which now has been moved away from our lives, right? So now we don't live with our parents, we don't live with our aunts or sisters, and somehow we got disconnected from the process of birth. And it's not natural for us because it's, it's like a totally unknown territory for women. And a lot of women don't even want to talk about it until it's really necessary, until they are right at the moment of birth. Why is this happening and how can we change this? Yeah, so important to talk about that because if it was a hundred years ago and we were who we are, but a hundred years ago, I always love to do this and everyone listening, you know, do you have younger brothers and sisters? You would have been at those births because a hundred years ago, no matter where you are in the world, birth was at home. And in some parts of the world, it's only 40 years ago that all births were at home. So depending on where you are, you may only go back a short while. Mm -hmm. And many of us, myself included, my parents were born in at home. My grandmother was born at home. My great grandmother was born at home. And they were present for all their brothers and sisters that were younger. Um, people came together for cousins. We lived, as you say, we don't live together in the same house, but many times we don't even live in the same community. But years ago we did. And so our mother would go to offer support to another family member, and the children would often come along. So we're some of the early generations where we don't have any exposure to birth. If we were my great grandmother, she had been at numerous births. So she never talked about fear or pain when she told her birth story. She talked about confidence and moving and the ecstasy of feeling the baby slide from your body to your arms. And it's so different when I heard those stories of someone who didn't take a class about birth, didn't read a book about birth, but the first birth she saw was not her own. Where today, most people, the first birth we see is our own and the unknown is laden with fear. So I love doulas. I say to everybody, become a doula because get out, go to births. Even if you train, I have people train with me all the time because they want to be with their sister. They're going to be at their daughter's birth. They're going to be at their best friend's birth. And rather than just show up without any skill set, really learn some doula skills. And really doulas were what our ancestors were. They learned how to be doulas from the other women that went before them at birth that they saw. Now we have to come out to a workshop to remember yeah. our great grandmother's wisdom. But I know the doulas I teach, when it's time for them to have a baby and they've already attended three births, two births, 10 births, 20 births, whatever it is, they go into birth with so much more confidence. When we hear you talk about, at least for some women, when they, when they hear about having pleasure in giving birth, having an ecstasy state in giving birth, for them it looks like it's very, very far away because, as you said, there's a lot of media, there's a lot of histories, actually, of trauma during birth. So can you explain a little bit more about what, what it is about to have pleasure and ecstasy and how can you prepare yourself also for that? Yeah, great question. And it is really hard because I think of our current maternity model in hospitals around the world often as broken or dysfunctional. And it's not a system designed to bring you pleasure, to make this the most intimate, special moment. It's really you're getting on the conveyor belt of industrialized childbirth. It's like going to McDonald's and thinking that you're going to get a special order. You know, you can modify what they have, but you're not going to get lasagna, right? Yeah. So you can't go into this broken model that's not a all looking at how to keep you comfortable and finding sacredness and pleasure you can do it but it's going to be really hard to get it so the number one thing is we have to change the model or many people have to really put together 
a special team. And it's easier to find pleasure and joy in birth when you're in an environment that you feel safe, that you are respected, that you have privacy. So we see this easily in home birth. We see this much easier in birth centers, which are really someone else's home that you go to. If you're not familiar with birth centers, look them up. Yeah. Um, and we need to find hospitals that create home-like atmospheres. So the first thing that I would say to people is you can't just, you know, you're right to say, how am I going to do this? Because if you're going to a McDonald's-like institution and nothing looks like pleasure, it's going to be hard to find it. So you're going to have to do some homework and really investigate where you give birth who's there and what their beliefs are, what your own beliefs and values are, you know, to address them and to get in touch with stories of people that have found pleasure. But once you have the right place and the right team, it's really relatively easy because our bodies were designed to give birth with joy and love and pleasure and ecstasy. And it's really amazingly simple in the right places to tap into that. In the work that you do, I'm sure that there is a place for pain, for the mystifying pain. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. And you know, some people, even with the right circumstance, the right place, all the right techniques and learning will still experience pain. A lot of other people will reframe that, and I work with lots of people that pain is not a word that they would use, but many people will call it intense or challenging moments. And what's really interesting about labor is it comes in waves, right? Where you feel a sensation or a surge, we often call them a wave, and then you have a break. And in those breaks, as you know, we feel like we're feeling right now. And when you think about the sensation and the break and the sensation and the break, and then the emotions we have, you're gonna experience more sensations and more emotions in a short period of time than you ever do in any other day in your life. So it is possible to have pain and another moment pleasure. It is possible to have a sensation that's challenging and one that creates ease and ecstasy. So we're not saying that we're devoid of anything. We're saying that we can bring it all there. But I will add that when we're riding the hormones, the energy, the feelings of pleasure, pain and pleasure travel on the same pathway. And the more that we stay in pleasure, it's less likely we will feel pain or we will feel less pain. But I don't want anyone to believe that they may have a pain-free labor. There are few people that do it. I wasn't one of them. I wouldn't call my sensations painful, but they were hard and challenging. And I think we don't call it labor for just a you know simple reason. It is work and it does take preparation of body, mind, spirit, and sexuality. And when we prepare the wholeness of ourselves, then we can address all the different ways that we experience labor. And I do want to say about pain, sometimes it's not physical pain, it's emotional pain. And so pain is on many different levels. And I also want, I just came from being at a really great donut trainer conference and with two of my mentors, Penny Simpkin and Phyllis Klaus. And Penny Simpkin always reminds us that we can bear our pain, but no one should suffer in childbirth. And if pain becomes suffering, that's when we're really glad that we have options and alternatives for that. So I do like Penny's distinction because most of us can learn techniques to manage pain or challenge or strong sensations. But I do want to distinguish that if anyone is suffering, then we're really blessed to have more ranges to help you because no one should suffer in childbirth. Yeah. Um, that's another topic that I would like to talk about is about options and alternatives. 
So options and alternatives, sometimes I feel that in the way that women are perceiving, the way that options are given to them, sometimes is in a way that it seems like they need to do it in a certain way. And sometimes it feels like uh, they are taking us away from our power, but we are also delivering our power to another person. You want to talk a little bit about that and how, how it is so important to make informed decisions about pregnancy and labor. Yes. And I love how you said that because one of my quotes that I say always when I'm teaching is there's power in childbirth. And you can either claim it or give it away, but somebody's going to get it. So if you understand that there's more power in this day than almost probably for me any other day in our life, then you make that decision. And when you claim your power, part of claiming your power is being prepared, choosing the right place and the right people, but it's also making decisions and you need to be informed. Education is power. So taking the time to understand all your options, because as much as we prepare for birth, we're only 50%. The baby's preparing the other 50%. Yes. And if you're a parent, sometimes our children listen to us well, but sometimes they have their own mind. And babies already sometimes, sometimes turn a different way than we thought or, you know, put their hand by their head when we'd rather it was down or, you know, and those are simple ways. But babies in their birth process sometimes need us to do different things to help them safely come into the world. So decisions have to be made both in pregnancy and in birth that are considering what's best for we say mother baby, one word, capital M, capital B, no space. We are two people, but we are completely one unit at this time. And we're making decisions that affect each of us. So when we're making what we often call informed decisions, it's important to know we want to hear our caregiver's advice. But as you say, it should be given in a non-judgmental way, in an open way. And I always like to say we use our brain and we use the acronym that brain means. So the B, what are the benefits of what you're suggesting? Um, R, what are the risks? Because sometimes things have a benefit, but they have a side effect. What are the alternatives? Because sometimes there's something else that we could do or give a try and wait and see if that works. What does our intuition say? Because we're all very wise, especially when you're pregnant. Mm -hmm. You know your baby, you are so intimately connected that you are going to get that gut feeling, that intuition of, yes, we should do this now, it'd be best, or no, I don't want that. So what does that say? And the end is not now or never, that we can both agree and we can very respectfully refuse and listen to what's best. And sometimes the refusal is let me try an alternative and let's assess again in 30 minutes. So I think informed decision making for me, as you kind of nailed it on the head, is an essential way that we stay in our power and are part of that. When people allow other people to make decisions for them, that's often where we have birth trauma, where we go look back and say, oh, why did I do that? You know, had I just taken another 30 minutes and gotten the shower, maybe it would have all been different. Um, and you don't get a second chance in birth. So it's really important that we take the time we need, that we have the information, and that we can make decisions that really honor who we are and what feels right for us and our baby. And the connection that continues, that um, was brought together in conception, in pregnancy, that connection continues during childbirth. So it is something that, of course, we can uh, stimulate mothers to have, to communicate with their babies, to sense, to have a feeling of their babies, 
to understand the messages of their own bodies, but also understand the messages that the babies are delivering to them. And that is something that I see that in our days, because sometimes I, sometimes even in my own work, I see how women can feel disconnected during pregnancy from their own babies. And then they start practicing the breathing, the relaxations, the meditations, and suddenly there is an unfolding of this bond. And I think that it's so important because during the process of childbirth, it still continues. And it's also, again, we're talking about the power that it's, that it's given to us and that we don't give to anyone else consciously. When we do that, independently of sometimes the type of labor that we got to have because we can't control everything, as you said, you know, sometimes we expect one thing and, you know, and decisions have to be made fast something happen but if the connection is there the connection continues throughout the childbirth and it continues after birth because then we have the process of the postpartum period that it's so important to keep that connection and and for breastfeeding and so on so do you want to talk a little bit about how you feel in your own work how important it is the connection and the communication that exists between mother and baby yeah, you said it so well, too. I mean, they are one unit, and the baby is constantly communicating. I mean, we feel they're at a certain point in pregnancy, their kicks and their wiggles, and that's communication of touch. But we're intimately connected. And I always say to everyone, you know, as you said, to breathe, to do relaxation. But baby massage, I think, starts in utero. Massage your own body massage your baby at least once, if not more times a day, but also send your thoughts because our thoughts are powerful. You know, we now know the kind of our energy can be felt for eight feet around us. You know, you know when you walk near someone without words, you already begin to feel a bit like, are they welcoming me? Are they in a bad mood? Stay clear. So babies are not eight feet away. They're right there or postpartum we're holding them they feel every single emotion that we're having so being able to consciously connect to them send our love send our feelings in labor ask them what do they need to have a safe birth and listen babies will often be giving you feedback sometimes they need a longer path sometimes they need you to move a different way and that's so true once they're here they already have their own personality their needs their desires and we need to really be close to them to hold them to listen and even though they don't have language as we're using today they certainly have the language of their eyes the language of their heart the language of touch in their body and the more we realize that we're communicating on all these levels the more open we can be to really honor and hear our baby and what we all want all through our life is to be seen and heard and that's what our babies want right from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. One other thing that I would like you to address would be the role of men, the role of a partner that is supporting the women to have what she wishes to be a pleasurable birth. Yes. And partners play such an important role. And I love working with partners, fathers, whoever that person is that's really there for support. Because I often say what they want to do is love your partner through labor. And it's both ways. In preparation, you both need to be loving on each other and loving the baby. But you know, as a partner, what does your the birthing mother what does the birthing person need um i love a book i highly recommend it to everyone but certainly when you're pregnant the five love languages because we all communicate love in different ways and sometimes challenges in relationships come because we're loving in our way but the other person's language of love is different so they're not 
hearing it and feeling that love. And so I really encourage couples in pregnancy partners to really communicate and find out what are the ways that you can offer your love? What way is your love most received? And then to have a list of 10 things you can do that are loving, that bring pleasure, that bring joy in pregnancy, but in birth so that if you scatter those bits of love all throughout labor that's going to help the hormone of love flow and that's oxytocin is the hormone that helps labor go gentler and easier so my number one tip is this is about communication this is about love and really finding the ways that you can each communicate your love through the process. Now, of course, there's many more than that, but that's my number one. <laughs> yeah, and, and then it's, a, that's, it's, a, it's definitely a great one. What, what do you think um, needs to change in society, in the system, for us to provide women a more safe, a more loving, nurturing place to give birth? I think that it needs to be as home-like as possible. I think it's absolutely absurd that we go into a room that we associate for sick people. If a hospital has birth, it needs to not look like every other hospital room that looks like sick people. Most of us have either been in a hospital ourselves or for loved ones, and the association there is usually not of pleasure. Um, I don't know anybody who thinks of when they think of a great night having sex, thinks of, I'm gonna go to a hospital room, right? Um, most people don't even feel a hospital is safe um, in the way that you want to open to the deepest parts of yourself. So we've got to change the rooms. And the data is strong. Science says this. Science says that if you go give birth in a room that looks the same as a sick room, you're going to have worse outcomes because our mind feels right what we see so we've got to change the environment is big for me and you're right it has to feel safe and we all have to define what safety is often that's dim lights um bringing our own personal things so it looks like us a bit the smells i mean who whoever bottles hospital aroma and takes it home because it makes you feel good i don't know anyone mm -hmm. so it's really the whole package what we see what we smell what we hear what are the sounds what we feel touch we take in on all our senses and so it's really a question for each individual what do you need to feel safe what do you need to feel private what do you need to allow yourself to open to the intimacy of birth? And I would say that this is very similar to what you need to have a safe, satisfying sexual time, either alone or with a partner. So ask yourself when you look at your birthplace, could I make love here and have a really satisfying sexual experience? And, and if the answer is no, you're going to have a hard time giving birth there too. And you've got to change that up. Mm -hmm. What do you think um, is a good welcoming environment for your baby? I think babies need the same thing. They need dim lights. They need nice smells, you know. They need to never be separated. And I mean never. Even a baby that might need extra help needs the love and care of their mother and then the extra care on top of that. So really babies need very, very little, but they are, have been one, one with your body. And this is not the time after birth to make them become two. We know that babies, when they're separated, have a natural response called protest despair. And a baby protests by crying and only stops when they're in such despair, they have no energy to carry on. A baby in despair has elevated adrenaline levels. And this is never healthy certainly not for a newborn but we know that stress hormones aren't good for us in life so the best thing we can do is always keep our baby close keep the environment gentle if you think about it they've been in a semi dark environment and bright lights are startling cold rooms are startling 
Too many people handling them are startling. So we really must think about it. Ina May Gaskin, a great midwife, often said, and it struck me in my heart, that we give more gentle care to baby animals. If we were walking in with newborn puppies just born, we wouldn't think of grabbing the puppy and putting it over here and rubbing it with something and giving it a shot. And we would not disturb it. We would know that it has to just stay with its mother. And we need to start really thinking about our babies. What do you want your baby to remember as their first minutes, their first hours? Mm -hmm. What would you want if you were the baby? Personalize it. And I think each person knows then how to create that gentle, loving, respectful, environment mm -hmm. i think that's one of the keys it's it's uh, when women talk with me and they don't know what to do i often ask them what do you think your baby would want and that is a question that they don't often i think not enough times ask themselves because babies have consciousness and in a mother there is an effusion of body of emotions of thoughts with her baby she can sense what the baby would like on that moment and how it would like it to be. Always. And, you know, new studies are really showing this. The field of pre and perinatal psychology, I'm fascinated with because they're taking 18 month old and two year old children and giving them like a dollhouse of what the room looked like when they were born. And so if it's a hospital, it has, you know, hospital beds and monitors and everything miniature, right? Mm -hmm. And they ask the children to set up the room when they were born and every child does it exactly. Like, think about this. The baby remembers where the machine was and then where the people are and they'll put like the partner over here and then when the baby's born they'll say where's the baby and children will literally take the baby and put it across the room to the isolate and when they say well where did you want to be every child takes the baby right back to mom so our children are amazingly conscious we haven't been taking the time to listen and sadly a lot of children have trauma a lot of babies are really not welcomed in a warm loving way and i think we all have to demand more mm -hmm. and parents need to speak up this is your body, your baby, your birth, and you deserve to do it in a way that honors and respects you all. Tell us a little bit about your projects, what you are into, what are your trainings, what you are doing. Tell us about that. So thank you. Well, I love to teach doulas and nurses and midwives and doctors all over the world because I think in our hearts, we all want to do better. And as I said, there's so many simple ways. So I'm leading retreats around the world. I hope people will join me. Um, one that's always special is Bali every year with midwife Robin Lim and many guest teachers. And that's eatpraydoula.com. But on my own own website, DeborahPascaliBenaro.com. I have a lot of workshops and I'm brewing up some new ones. We're even looking in the future of uh, maybe more in Greece in sailing on a ship. So if you really want to do some work in other ways, and otherwise I teach a lot in the New York area near where I am, but I'm envisioning a new film. I'm kind of gestating <laughs> um, a second film about the sexuality of birth. So we're just kind of shooting trailer in like footage to do a GoFundMe. So I hope that people will support us to bring this information out in new ways. And I have an online childbirth class, my last mm -hmm. one. So anybody who wants to prepare themselves more, visit paintopowerchildbirth.com and you can actually work with me on how you too can experience a birth full of power and pleasure. Mm -hmm. How would you envision a good future for mothers, for babies, for generations to come? 
Yeah. I really do believe that we're turning the tide. And I feel that in every aspect of me and working with providers all around the world. So I vision that we are going to have more home birth for those that want it and those that it's safe for. I also vision we're gonna have more home birth in the hospital where we can transform our hospitals into safer, gentler, more respectful environments that allow people to have more love-filled, orgasmic births. <laughs> um, but I also envision that people themselves will be more educated. I think too many people out of fear are not digging deep into this. They just mm -hmm. think it's another day, let my doctor do it, let my midwife do it. And it hasn't served us well by giving our power over at this time. Mm -hmm. So I envision both sides, kind of the consumers will take back birth in their own way and the caregivers are ready to change and then we all can meet together so everybody plays a part and everybody makes a difference Deborah, thank you so much for your thoughts for your knowledge for your wisdom it's such a great time that we had together it was such a great time and I, unfortunately we are ending our interview, but I hope that this is going to be one of many. You have so many things to talk about and to teach us. And uh, we are going to put all the links that you just share with us on, on our interview on the YouTube channel. So everybody can address those things if they want to and they should. Because, you know, there is, there is definitely reasons why women are feeling unprepared for pregnancy for birth and for childhood so for motherhood so if they can have that information in their power it's it's great thank you so much for all your projects for your life for what oh, you are dedicating yourself to because you are dedicating yourself to mothers to children to this new generation and that is it was such an honor Oh, thank, thank you. Stuff. Such an honor to Susanna. And thank you to everyone who joined us or is watching anywhere in the world. I wish you all pleasure and love. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.